All right, well, Daniel, let's let's just get this over with nice and quick, okay? Right, yes. All right, welcome to the Sad Boys Book Club. My name's Dusty. Good morrow, scholars, and I'm Daniel. Oh, you sound straight like... You sound like you're straight out of Geneva. Yes. Geneva Brixton. Yes. And we're, we're, we're covering Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. A jolly good book, that... I was. I thought you were going to continue on, and I forgot that that so, uh, British people sometimes end their sentences with the word "that." I was. I thought you were going to say a jolly good book that something. I was not prepared for you know. to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's it's this book is um, very different from all of the books we've covered before. It's um, mostly because it it's two hundred years old. Yes, it is definitely the oldest book we've covered. Um, and it is very uh, written in a very erudite way. Yeah. And very, very prim and proper. Um, more commas than I've ever seen in my life. Um, eat your heart out, Cormac McCarthy. Uh, it, it's it's good, though. Um Yeah. I, I had I had heard before reading this, like you know, in years past, that this this is a really tough book to read because of the language, because of its age and all that. And so I was expecting like basically something kind of like Dante's Inferno, which I have tried I tried to read when I was a teenager because that was that was the thing that teenagers did. Oh, I go read Dante's Inferno. Or, um, uh. I'm I'm sorry. The Divine Comedy. I let me let me let me correct myself here. Uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, uh, uh, and I I couldn't do it. I was I maybe I could do it now if I really tried. But when I was a teenager, I was like oh, I just I I'm getting nothing out of this. I I I, I don't know. But I, I didn't get that from this so far. There have been some some times where my eyes glaze over a little bit reading this, and I'm just like, yes, words, but um, using a skill that I learned in grade school uh, that I feel like not a lot of people have nowadays called context clues. I think I've been able to f get over any literary bumps that my smooth donkey brain might have struggled with with the, the, the literature in this book. Yeah, I mean, there's some stuff that's um, maybe a little bit written a little bit differently than you'd see now, but I don't know. I Overall, I wouldn't say it's been too bad. I have had zero issues following the plot itself. Yeah, the plot the plot is stunningly straightforward, actually. Yeah. And I, I think it's safe to say that uh, Mary Shelley was probably smarter than me. Yeah, she was uh, quite intelligent. And um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a good book so far. And... Um, I don't know. I, I guess we should uh, we should mention, you know, as as last month was, uh, we celebrated Black History Month with uh, Toni Morrison's beloved. Uh, go back and check that out if you haven't. Uh, highly recommend and or and or just check out that book. It was it was incredible. Uh, for uh, Women's History Month, we are doing uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which uh, is possibly the first sci-fi novel. I feel like I can say that to a yeah. certain extent. I'm, I'm sure that there's other things that you could point to. Um, I remember reading many years ago about like, and I don't know, I don't, who knows if this is true or not. There was like a, a sort of speculative fiction, like dating back even to the time of the Roman Empire. I think, if I remember correctly, there was like it was like a speculative fiction about Roman centurions going to the moon to fight people that live on the moon <laughs> so maybe that would be the first quote-unquote science fiction but i don't know for my money i think i in in terms of a, a form that we would recognize as being uh you know similar enough to to science fiction that we see today um i think i think it w I'm, i feel comfortable uh dating it back to uh mary shelley's frankenstein yes also very well known prequel to leviathan wakes <laughs> part of the the broader uh, SBBCU <laughs> the SBLU 
Oh, okay. SBLU. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, this is something that you and I have talked about, I think, since at least August or September of last year when we, we first had the plan to do these um, these monthly themes. And uh, we both agreed that uh, that Mary Shelley had to be who we who we chose for um, Women's History Month because, I mean, who better than, I would argue, the most influential woman in the horror genre. That's true. It's also it's also horror. It's um, horror, and again, also pretty recognizable to the con- current context. I think when when was Edgar Allan Poe writing? Um, it was, it was, I, I think it was similar. close to this time. It, I, it was 19th century, wasn't it? it may, maybe late 19th century. I think this was it early was. 19th. I think it was early mid. I think. I think, but I think she still predates him because I think she does. Frankenstein originally came out in 1818. Yeah, which but the he copy would have been, we are reading. Oh, go he, ahead. He would have been nine years old when this came out. Okay, well then I think it's it's safe to say that she predates him there. Yeah, and uh, you know, hot hot take. Um, I'm gonna say Frankenstein's probably gonna be it's probably better than any Edgar Allan Poe story. Hmm. All all you all you kids with your uh, with your black hair and your your black nail polish and your black T-shirts and your your Tim Burton uh, uber fandoms. Uh, all you teenagers, uh, one day you'll grow up and realize that Edgar Allan Poe is. Uh, not as good as you think he is. In fact, I, I'd say he is uh, remarkably mediocre. Fight me. You would say he's a poser. He's an Edgar Allan poser. <laughs> that might have been know. the joke I... you were making. It was. It was. Uh, it was the. Um... It was a joke, but I was gonna say, you know, I, I, I liked his the, you know, what I've read of him, uh, well enough, but it's been some time since I've gone back to him. So, uh, I just, you know, for me, it's it's just it's very much one of those like look how edgy I am kind of kind of authors. A lot of his stories, to me, it, it just kind of bleeds this whole like shock value for the sake of shock value, and just. Uh, to me it's just really not very interesting like oh i buried a man yeah. in the floorboard and now i'm just hallucinating him talking or be- his heart beating uh, it's, it's i i don't care man i just i'm sorry i don't care i i, I grew up man wow I, I i don't even know where to go with this i i am i'm astonished that this has become an anti uh, edgar Allan poe <laughs> podcast my point being is Mary Shelley's the real OG, and uh, uh, everyone should read Frankenstein because it's very good. Yeah, um, it's broken up a little differently um, than I was expecting. I mean, than I think most people would expect because the first part of the book is kind of written in, and this is it's a, here's comes our favorite literary term, everybody. The epistolary format. Epistolary. I yeah. I remember. I remember. I didn't forget. <laughs> we we in the first part, portion of the novel is written in an in an epistolary format between a man named uh, Robert Walton and his sister Margaret Savile. Not to be um, confused this... with uh, with Sam Walton. Or Jimmy Savile. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, definitely not him. Um. So, so anyway, th- this is. It's essentially this part. I I don't to the point where we have read in the book. Um, perhaps I am missing something here, but it does not yet seem to intersect with um. What is happening in the book? Is is that your is that your read as well? Uh no. Okay, well then I'm obviously missed it. Go ahead. Did you did you not read and... letter four? I read every part of it. I may not remember it, but I definitely did read it all. Yeah. So they 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 found so. So they they they're traveling uh, through Antarctica to try and uh, I don't remember the. They're, they're trying to find the Northwest Passage. That's right. Um, and they see they see uh the monster. Uh, sorry, minor spoilers. But who else would it be? 
uh, they see the monster um, basically um, dog sledding through the Antarctic. And a couple days later, they find uh, Victor Frankenstein as well. His, he's I think he only has like one dog left. And they find him oh. and they're just kind of chatting with him. And uh, they bring him on board. And he, he the, the, the captain uh, is just kind of being friendly with him. But he's like, I don't really... Um, I don't really want to pry into this man's life. I don't really want to, you know, everybody's wanting to ask him all these questions. I'm going to give him his privacy. I'm, I just, I'm just going to focus on, you know, making sure he's okay and all that. And then Victor's like, Hey, you've been super good to me. Um, I know you've been super polite and intentionally not asking me the questions. I know you want the answers to. So, um, I'm just going to tell you my life story. I'm going to tell you the tragedy of my, of my life and how I got to this point. And that's the end of letter four is him writing to, uh, Miss Seville, uh, saying and he then he started to tell me his story and then we go into chapter one which is Victor's story. Okay, well, I somebody did not get... somebody started reading this book at bedtime and was not ready to read it the first twenty pages is what I'm hearing. I mean, I I did not get that the strain that the the uh, weird guy pulling the sled uh, was the monster. I I didn't get that and I definitely did not get that the the guy that they recovered what because i remember all that stuff you mentioned i just did not uh associate it with frankenstein whatsoever Wait, how they, they see they didn't massive... say his name was he didn't say his name was frankenstein yeah, yeah but he also said i'm going to tell you my tale and then it just starts going into the story of victor and he's he's, he's telling it in first person he's like i was i figured it would come back around i, I don't know i i didn't really think about it i was just like I, I was I after I got past it and I was into the the narrative about Frankenstein, I pretty much put it out of mind except for oh yeah there was they were going on the there was a guy searching for the Northwest Passage and then there was a weird guy pulling a sled and there was a guy chasing after him I did not I didn't really actually and that's I didn't even really think about it until this very moment you know you know Daniel um earlier when I I made my my comment saying that um. Uh, a lot of people don't use context clues nowadays. I was not insinuating <laughs> you, but maybe I should have been. Maybe. Dude, like they, I don't know. They, they, just, they see I a just... giant man, like a giant humanoid person, dog sledding. Like who? Who else would it be? It's a giant person. It's not a normal person. It's a giant person. And then when when Victor's creating the monster and he's like, "Oh, I needed to make a giant person, so I made him eight feet tall and I made him proportion proportionate to that to that size." You didn't also think, "Oh man, there was a really big guy in the snow sled at the beginning of the of the book here. I wonder if that's the monster." Not at all, because I my understanding of the story of Frankenstein um, has not lined up with a single plot point um, that not we yet. have experienced so far um, not yet it hasn't all i know was there was like a there was a scientist or something and he i thought he lived in like england or something and he had a weird like a racial caricature of a slav working for him and uh the, the igor and they create and he created a monster and the monster did stuff and then the monster was killed Essentially, that to, to to avoid giving any potential spoilers, that was the entirety of the story. I I had no clue about any of this Northwest Passage stuff. I had no idea about about this any of this like like Switzerland. Basically, this is like an entirely different novel than my understanding of the story of Frankenstein. Um, so I'm I'm gonna pull back the curtain a little bit for me. I've never read this book. But I have studied it before in the past, so I actually what? I know th I know the full story, more how or less. How have you studied? Why, how did you study without reading it? I was interested in the story. I didn't own the book, so I read, like internet. I looked it up on the internet, read like literary analyses of it, watched if literary look... analyses of it on YouTube because I was super interested in it. And I'm like, I'll read it eventually, but I I, I want to like. I want I I'm, I'm impatient. I want to uh, ingest this now, and I, I did that like years ago. Like I was I was really really just interested in it. So like I mean the, it's in the public domain. You could have just read it then. Oh, I didn't know that until just now when you just said that. So 
I bought I bought my copy from Barnes and Noble for ten dollars like a month ago, and boy, is it a beautiful copy, by the way. The copy that I got, I, I really enjoy Barnes and Noble. If if people haven't picked up on that yet, and half price books, uh, but I have this beautifully illustrated copy. Um, let me let me let me go grab it. I want to give this illustrator credit. Um, hang on, let me go grab this real quick. You can tell how prepared I am because I have to walk into my room with my headphones dragging behind me uh, so I can grab my book. Uh, illustrated by William O'Connor. Uh, beautiful illustrations uh, scattered throughout the entire book. Uh, great copy. Highly recommend it. Cost me $10 at Barnes & Noble. Uh, really, really phenomenal artwork in this book. Cannot recommend it enough. It really adds to the experience. Um, yeah, I didn't realize I could read it for free in the public domain. But point point being is I know I know the the, the plot of this book. I, I I'm coming so... into it fully aware of the story that is told in it. Um so yeah, I, I you know but I, I feel like it's very similar uh to like coming into a, a book after watching the movie adaptation to where because like I said I've never read the book, so there's going to be like you know, pieces of it that are going to be new to me, uh, details that somebody did not write about or talk about in a video that, you know, little minor, minor details here and there. Cause most of the time they only just cover the broad strokes. Uh, so yeah, I'm aware of the, the plot of this book more or less. And, um, so let me ask you, and, and, and I, I apologize for derailing us here, but, uh, this is something that I actually wanted to ask in the beginning, what what made you choose this book? What made you interested in this book specifically? Like for us to cover here, or just in general? Just I mean both really, but I feel like I feel like you that both one will inform the other. Um yeah, it's you know it's 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 just a it's a legendary horror story. Um especially um uh, I, I feel like the the context surrounding Mary Shelley writing this book is almost as legendary as the book itself with her having to basically hide her identity as a woman because of the time period um so many so many things are inspired by frankenstein it's it's it really is like the original of it's like the first of its kind and it's just it's a super interesting story i mean the the whole the whole it, it's it's very similar uh it has it, it it shares a very similar theme and i think i talked about this uh last last summer in the video with the similar concepts with like john hammond and the dinosaurs in jurassic park and you know that was a theme that i that really resonated with me in jurassic park it's the same kind of i really enjoy uh that the the theme of um man creates monster but who truly is the monster kind of things um so uh it's just kind of it's it's a book that 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 has always kind of struck a chord for me and I just really love the story surrounding Mary Shelley herself and the story of the book itself so it's just I've always had an interest in in things like this it's it's cool I, I I'm, I'm a so this may not be this may not be like wholly evident in anything that I've said or done over the course of all of these uh books and videos but I'm a major major horror buff uh, I love me some good horror. I love me some bad horror too. Like I, I grew up. My my first my first horror movie was uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Two: Freddy's Revenge. Uh, don't know why it was. Well, I I know why it was the second one, but uh, uh, basically it was because the the my my mom's friend we'd go over to her house and that was the only one she had at the time was number two. So that's why it was the second one. But uh, I don't know why she only had the second one, but. Um, yeah, my, my, my first horror movie was remarkably homoerotic, uh, <laughs> and also not very good if we're being honest. Freddy's, Freddy's Revenge is not very good, but, uh, I've always grown up, grown up with like a major, major fan of, of horror movies. One of my, my favorite horror movie is probably Friday the 13th part six. Uh, that movie's phenomenal. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm a big horror buff is my point, And I, I really love some really good horror. So things like Frankenstein are, are like really cool for someone like me because this is like true original classic horror to where it's not quite like modern horror where it's it's all about the cheap scares and the the like fake suspense and the all build no release kind of things and with their with their shitty like endings and twists where it's like and then the bad person uh turns out the good guys they all they tried ended up not working and the bad guy wins and everybody dies the end haha jump scare and then you know you get that stinger ending 
uh, like this is more classic horror where it's like it's the it's this it's it, I don't want to say it's quite psychological, but it's like almost psychological to where it's like it really just kind of bores into you to where it's not so much like it's scaring you because what's happening is scary. It scares you because of the the thoughts that it, it gives you. It's the 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 correct the, the 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 scenarios the the story that it tells is it's one of those things to where it's like it leaves it, it leaves an imprint on you and the more you think about it the more the kind of the situation itself terrifies you in the in the um uh what's the word i'm looking for here in the uh the hypothetical maybe not the hypothetical per se but kind of that's kind of the word i'm looking for uh so yeah, it, it's not it's not what you would think of as like modern horror, but it's a truly classic horror where it's all about the uh, the build than uh, than the uh, the flash. It's about the stake, yet, not the sizzle. And yet, it also is very modern in the sense that you know a lot of times now that there's a lot of there, there's there's horror mixed with a different genre. Um, in this case, it's sci-fi. You know, it's the you know this this guy is using his his uh, you know scientific knowledge to to uh, reanimate a corpse essentially, um, which you know it, it, sci-fi horror is something that you know probably even before, but definitely from the time of uh, Alien. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. It's kind of. Um, how ahead of its time it is in that respect yeah and i i think it's uh it's very apropos that you you used alien as an example because i feel like alien is very similar uh with frankenstein in in terms of how it builds its horror alien mm -hmm. is very much more of a uh once it gets going once the xenomorph is on um on the ship and uh it's starting to pick off the crew one by one it's it becomes a little more of like what you would expect a horror movie to be but with frankenstein you know we have this this build of and we don't really have we don't have we're still building at the end of volume one here but uh it's all about that build it's all about set the setup getting the establishment going and now we're starting to see a little bit of the release with the monster itself uh even though we've only really seen the monster twice at this point and they've been very fleeting moments uh, but it's it's very similar. Alien Alien does follow a similar structure, in my opinion. Uh, very very loosely, maybe to where it's you do get that really nice setup, and then um, at least with Alien, uh, when once the setup is done, it becomes uh, an all gas no breaks kind of affair all the way up to the end when uh, when when Ripley is finally able to uh, uh, deal with the Xenomorph, but. Uh, I, I do I do think you you bringing up alien is a very very fair comparison and I, I hope that does not imply any potential spoilers to you because it's I'm gonna tell you right now that Frankenstein is not as action packed as alien but it, it's it's I feel like it, it follows a very similar kind of structure of the horror of it not so much the plot but the horror of it well, what, one thing that if we're comparing it to things, I might compare it to, um, and we can we can get back into other stuff. I just but as long as we're comparing things, it also kind of reminds me of something like a Silent Hill or something. Insofar as the monster is is an important aspect, certainly, but it's really really it's more of what the monster sort of to this point represents. It's the sort of the uh, the the guilt of Frank Victor Frankenstein and his his uh, ambiguity and refusal to take responsibility for the this this life that he created essentially and so kind of in a similar way to a, a more uh, psychological horror uh, like like uh, Silent Hill for example there's a lot of there is there is a there are aspects of horror. But the action is not as necessarily is not necessarily the point, and it is very symbolic in nature. So, so what I'm getting from this is Victor Frankenstein is James Sunderland, the monster is Pyramid Head, and Maria is William Frankenstein. I mean, I I would say that's not an uh, unapt comparison. I don't know if that's necessarily 
what was in the mind of, of uh, Team Silent when they were making uh, Silent Hill 2, but I feel like it is of a piece with that kind of thing. Yeah, and I feel like another another thing that makes this book so legendary and, and what makes Mary Shelley such an icon of, of the genre uh, and just in, an icon of literature in general um, is that I feel like whether or not someone like I, I don't I'm, I you know forgive me anyone who, who cares I don't know who the writer of Silent Hill 2 was um, but uh, I, I, I don't know if if he necessarily had Frankenstein as a, as a direct influence for his writing for Silent Hill but I feel like even if he didn't at least intentionally subconscious subconsciously the thread I feel like always goes back to Frankenstein because this yeah, really I mean, is like that much of a foundation for the horror genre even to this day well it's just like even if you are making music that is sound, not even rock music sounds nothing like the Beatles for example the Beatles there there's just they just exist as part of the um the DNA of the uh you know just a, a, of the just of the language of recorded music at this point you know yeah and then even then you could you could even with the Beatles you can and I'm sure John Lennon would agree with me 100% on what I'm about to say with this but like you could take the Beatles and push that back to like Chuck Berry and you could take something like Chuck yeah. Berry and you could push that back to like um 1920s and 30s jazz um oh god I always forget his name more uh, blues but yeah jazz and blues yeah uh, I, I, I'd say maybe blues mostly actually sorry I meant to say blues um, yeah like like old like 1920s and 30s blues music uh, which was the I, I would say is probably the progenitor of rock music so you could always you can also push it back even further to that and boy man I don't know if you've s small tangent here I don't know if you've ever listened to some of the um, the more uh, famous uh, blues songs um, they're really good. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of the blues. Um, Robert Johnson, that's who I'm thinking of. Yeah, Robert Johnson, um, Sunhouse, Odetta Tharp. That's, that, that's kind of the, I, that's the milieu that kind of uh, informed and kind of created rock music. It is, it is crazy uh, to, to hear uh, the, the, some of the, the techniques and uh, music that, that Robert Johnson did in, uh, in his music uh, because it's, it's things that if you, if you think about it, if you listen to it now, it doesn't really sound particularly special or of, any, of a particular note. But if you think about the fact that it's, it's music that's almost 100 years ago, uh, and you think of and you listen to other music the, the what was contemporary at that time it, it's it's kind of crazy just how ahead of his time he was his techniques his style of play the music he wrote it's it's remarkable it's it's almost like it's almost like he was a time traveler that went back in time and 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 wrote things that he knew would would be popular in the future and just it's it's crazy. Robert Johnson's story is insane. Highly recommend anybody look into Robert Johnson and his and his story. It's a very tragic story. Uh, the man, man lived a hard life and didn't really ever truly get the recognition that he deserved until long after his death. But uh, icon, absolute icon of blues, absolute icon of music in general. Highly recommend looking into Robert Johnson and listening to what little music of his we have. Uh, and how does this relate to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? I'm glad you asked uh, because. Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, I feel like, is a similar, similar thing with with her influence on the horror genre, and uh, you know, like I said, like the the, it's it's just good. It's good stuff. It's this this is a great book. I really enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you're going to be very pleasantly surprised the further we go into it. Uh, I, I won't. I won't. I'm not gonna. You know, I'm not gonna say too much. Um, that could imply anything past what what we've read. Because you you don't know the story, but um, what you've told me so far with your this is what I was expecting and this is what we've gotten, I think you're going to be very very pleasantly surprised uh, with what the story turns into because uh, yeah it's 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 very very good and I think it's going to really uh, make you think in a lot of ways like you're a you're you're a velociraptor standing on the beach it's it's such a such a cool story.
I, I really love it. and I'm really I'm really excited to finally read it myself because like I said I've I'm aware of the story. I've I've watched and read a lot of analysis uh, analyses of the of the book itself, but I've never read it myself. So this is, uh, it 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 it's a new experience that feels old. That's that's really yeah. It's kind of an interesting place to be. Yeah. So l- like I said earlier, it, it's almost like reading reading the book after watching the movie adaptation. Yeah, I. I, I I well and truly, as I said, had have no because I have these I had these pre existing ideas of what the book would be, but uh, not not at all what um what I've seen so far. And uh, I guess why don't you go ahead and uh, I think we we've covered the letters pretty well. I mean maybe we could go back at, when when we get to the end and maybe we could trace some sort of thematic through lines. But why don't we go ahead and just kind of get through the first part of the you know uh your you your book is broken up into volumes uh right my yes. mine is not which is weird because i have a i have a preface in my book that's written by mary shelley and uh she's talking about how 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 she came to write the book and like the the process of it and the work she did with her husband on it and one of the things she says is, uh, I've gone back and 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 adjusted a few things. I've I've made a couple of minor changes. Uh, the the story is still intact. It's just a couple of of writing changes, uh, in volume one specifically. So, mm-hmm. Mary Shelley herself wrote this book in volumes. It looks like. Uh, so the fact that yours doesn't have, uh, any any separation like that, I just find crazy. Because why why does mine? Oh, I'm sorry. It's not the preface. It's an author's introduction. Mm-hmm. Uh, the preface is after that. Very, very good read, by the way. I loved reading this. Um, so I, 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 I might like if you're interested. I might give you a little snapshot of my author's introduction here, so that you can check it out at some point in time. Uh, I'm just kind of skimming it right now. Just yeah. So here, here's what she says. She said, "I have mended the language where it was so bald as to in, uh, interfere with the interest of the narrative." And these changes occur almost exclusively in the beginning of the first volume. Throughout, they are entirely confined to such parts as the mere adjuncts, ad- adjuncts to the story, leaving the. I'm sorry, I'm reading in the dark right now. Uh, leaving the core and substance of it untouched. Mary Shelley, London, October fifteenth, eighteen thirty-one. Hmm. Very interesting Man. read that author's introduction. I, I highly like. like I, said, I I can always take a couple screenshots and send them to you if you are interested. Well, I, in I have that introduction as well. I just, oh, you do. I, yeah. I just assume because I have a fancy copy that I have the fancy the fancy effects and you don't because you don't have a fancy copy. Well, it's kind of fancy. It's got like gilded pages and stuff. That that yeah. I'll, I I'm a sucker for stained pages. I'll I'll send you. I'll send you a picture of it too, um, but yeah, why don't, you can go ahead and and, and start us off. Um, we can we can probably get through this in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, because I I honestly feel like I can I can really skip a lot of everything uh, before him going to um, uh, Ingvolstadt, uh, going off to college basically, because a lot of the first couple of chapters is just kind of a I'm Victor Frankenstein these are my parents this is my family this is how I grew up uh, and this is just kind of my childhood and it's it's interesting it's a good read and it's a great way to establish Victor's character his interests his hobbies and what kind of drove him to uh, create this monster later on when he's in college um, but it, it's really just kind of that it's just it's just kind of character writing and it's a lot of just details of this this and that I, th- I feel like the biggest takeaways are his parents uh his <sighs> i understand this is how it was back then but I, th- I honestly think his father's a bit of a creep because uh his father had this really good friend and his friend basically went bankrupt and he left the the area and decided to be a hermit with his daughter and it took uh victor's father whose name I've forgotten. I think it's something like Pierre. Not, well, you know, because he's not French. I, I don't remember what his father's name is. Uh, it took him a while. I think it was somewhere in the ballpark of like 10 months to track down his friend. And when he found him, he found his daughter 
uh, basically crying over the coffin of his friend because his friend took ill and his daughter had to take care of him, but he succumbed to the sickness. And so uh, his father finds the daughter of his of his close friend crying over the coffin and is like, hey, um, he was my best friend. Uh, this sucks. I was hoping to find him and help him out. Uh, but since you're now, uh, you're now an orphan, why don't I take you in? And I will take care of you. And then two years later, he marries her. I will say, I, I think that is supposed to be kind of a... I mean, it's it's supposed to, to if not alarm people, it's supposed to put their, their guards up. I mean, at, the, at that point. I mean, I'm sure there is there were certain different uh, expectations at the time. I mean, well, yeah, I was going to say... But I was going to say, but there's other things that come later particularly during the adoption of Elizabeth that kind of make me think that this sort of weird like overly close fam- or like strange familial bonds is actually kind of a thing and it's supposed to give you a um it's supposed to unsettle you at the very least well the thing is is I don't I don't think that was Mary Shelley's intention because like that that's how a lot of a lot of upper no- noble or upper class families worked back then i mean there was a lot of in there was a lot of inbreeding with nobility or upper like royalty or whatever um back back in like the the you know 15th 16th 17th 18th century um and this takes place in the 18th the late 18th century by the way this book uh so i don't really think that was her intention because she does kind of show the Frankenstein family as this very loving, very caring, very supportive family that is willing to help out anybody. They're a very, very good family. Like that. I, I I do truly believe that the Frankenstein family are good people, but like, it's just kind of one of those things where we look at it now with our modern lens and it's, you see this man go and find this young woman, uh, mourning her father who was a close friend of his and he takes charge of her not not in a father daughter kind of way but just as a as a you know a man helping out the daughter of his friend and then he falls in love with and marries her and it, she even makes a comment Mary Shelley does about as Victor Frankenstein uh Victor makes a comment about how like despite the massive gaps in age between the two of them they fell in love and like had this this massive relationship where it was like he 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 doted over her he he did everything for her he did he he basically it makes it sound like he loved her truly and, and and completely and it's like it's supposed to be this very sweet kind of showing how his parents are what kind of people they are and how much that how much they how much love and care they they have so i do think it's supposed to be this like really nice and sweet thing because that's how things were at the time because you know, you know arranged marriages and basically daughters being being married off basically as soon as they were childbearing age off to men in their 30s or or older and it you know that's just kind of how things things were at that time so you know i don't think she intended it to be this look at this creep marrying this this young child it was just you know her saying here was another case of this being happening because this was the norm but for us nowadays it's just like oh oh man that's that's messed up yeah (laughs) You, you know I don't know. I strongly disagree. I think it is supposed to be, um, even contextually in the context of its time, supposed to be, if not like out, out and out, like, oh, that's disgusting. That's terrible. How could he do it? It should. It's going to raise eyebrows. And there, again, the reason I say this is because in this in the subsequent generation of like this, there's this sort of I don't know quite how to put it, but like there, she. she he more or less adopts her in, in of a sort and then he kind of then um you know interacts with her he, he becomes romantically involved with her just very similar to in the next generation of victor and elizabeth where where she uh in the text it says uh, he refers to her as as more than a sister i i you know and, and yeah, there's and he, he considers can, her did, his he says she is mine yeah he does <laughs> and that's the that's the point that's it's it there's this there's this sort of i don't want to say overly close because you can be close 
but not like that. I think there is sort of there is cert- a certain sort of undercurrent of, if not incest proper, a sort of spiritual incest that is occurring. It's like in, emotional in this incest. Um, sure, <laughs> that <laughs> certainly that yeah. I mean, it it is uh, there's like, but it's 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 uh, so that that's kind of my read on it is that it, I'm I'm going to and maybe I'm wrong. But I, I, I'm going to definitely assign, you know, I would I would err towards the side of intentionality with a writer as talented as Shelley. Yeah, and like I, I find it really funny too, because just, just to kind of catch us up here, so the uh, Victor's mother and father traveled a lot, and then at that point in time is where they give birth to Victor, and uh, they didn't have another child until Victor was seven years old. But in between, uh, in between that Uh, because they wanted a daughter at some point. They wanted their second child to be a daughter. And at some point, his mother uh, goes to, um, I think she's like a nurse or something. I don't remember exactly the details of it. But she goes to this place, and there's a lot of children there. And there's this little girl there that's around around Victor's age. I think she's a year younger. And her both of her parents had died uh, for some reason or another, and she was basically taken in and being taken care of by this this group and she basically adopts her she's like hey i'll take her off your hands i always wanted a daughter with beautiful blonde hair and this is this just this 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 kind of adds to your point that you were saying about about how how elizabeth is kind of taken into this family how victor's mother sets him up for this situation of hey i basically adopted this girl is she's like victor i've got a gift for you and you will receive it tomorrow and then tomorrow happens and it's hey i adopted this girl and that's why victor gets the idea of she is mine in his head because it's like he sees her as the gift for him and also this is very much intended by his mother because she even says so on her deathbed later on she basically said hey victor i've adopted your wife yeah i think so i think it's crazy yeah, I think this family is, I think we could say, so, at least somewhat deranged. I think that that this I would I would I would say this is all very intentional and start to to, to create this sort of like dark, strange vibe to the story from from the beginning. Yeah, and they they call each other cousins uh, because they're not quite brother and sister. Uh, even if 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 you wanted to like try and put like some sort of adoption brother sister like. I don't know if that would technically be step or not, but uh, yeah, they they call each I've other. I've always cousins. heard just people refer to as their their brother or sister, okay, or longhand like an adopted brother or sister. Yeah, but they don't even go that 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 far. It, they just consider each other cousins, which marrying cousins was common at that time as well. So I I don't know. It does kind of get it's that still... implication. It still feels like, at the very least, like I said, emotional incest, and it's just I I find that weird. I don't. I think I, you're supposed to. I, I think I think that's well. I do. Go ahead. I I do. I find it weird. Well, I think I mean just in terms of the story and just in general, it's like yeah, you're, I think you're supposed to. I think that's it is a little off putting, at least. Yeah. To put it mildly. Yeah. But uh, his his parents end up having two more children. Um, what's what's his, what's the middle son's name? It, it, it's Ernest, right? I think it's Ernest. Remember. One is the, William. No, William's the youngest. Right? Oh, okay, William's the youngest. Uh, I want to say it's Ernest. I keep, if it's I keep not trying Ernest, to say, it's something with an E. I keep trying to say Henry, but that's that's not it. That's his friend. Henry is his friend. Henry Clavel is his friend's name. Clarvel. It sounds like like that. Like he, there's someone's trying is to. Is it Clarvel? Cl- Clarvel? Clavel? Clarvel. It's C L E R V A L. Clarvel. Sorry, I I don't have my book open right now. Apologies for the pronunciation errors. Uh, Henry Clarvel is his friend. Uh, but yeah, they have two more children. Uh, after Victor and after Elizabeth gets so- somewhat adopted, it's uh, I'm gonna say Ernest. If I'm wrong, I apologize. His name has only been referenced like three or four times at this point in the book. He's not really important so far. 
uh, and he's he's like seven years younger than uh, than Victor. And then uh, at some point down the line, I don't think they ever specifically state when or how old Victor is when he's born. The youngest William is born, uh, and we we kind of get a little bit of Victor's upbringing and his interests. He he falls in love with uh, very very classical philosophy. He starts reading uh, philosophers like Agrippa and. Uh, Oh, what's his name? What's the other guy's name? I, I've forgotten. Some some Greek or Roman dude, like uh, Cordycephalitis or something like that is his name. Uh, Paul, Paul it was back, from, back when they were just making stuff up. Yeah, and his father writes it off. He's like, oh, that's that's trash that's been disproven. And yeah, uh, but because he doesn't explicitly state why it's trash, that makes Victor like even more interested in it. So he goes even deeper down the, the, the trash philosophy rabbit hole. And he gets super invested in in all of these these studies, uh, this the philosophy of nature, and all of this stuff, and that that ble- bleeds into uh, when he eventually goes to college. Uh, but before he goes to college, uh, Elizabeth catches the scarlet fever, and Victor's mom, in a bout of uh, very loving idiocy, decides I am going to personally go and take care of Elizabeth, despite everybody saying don't do it. She's contagious with the scarlet fever, and then she catches the scarlet fever and dies. And I'm like, man, you're stupid. Like Elizabeth is young. Uh, I don't think you being there would have been the difference maker between her living and dying. You're just your 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 motherly care mode got way too in your own way and you basically killed yourself because you decided to take care of a a sick young girl who probably would have been fine without you taking care of her and got yourself killed too and i'm like wow you're you're a very very loving person but you also probably are stupid at the same time many such cases yeah so his mother dies that that delays him going to college um uh, Ingvolstadt is the name of the college, right? Or at least the the, the place where the college is. That's the is that the t- yeah, that's the town where it is. Uh, I th- I think I'm saying that right. Uh, once again, I did not take I don't take notes. Uh, so I'm going purely it's, off it was the like top here. Ingolstadt or something like that. I, I I think you're probably closer than I am. Uh, that's where he goes to college, and one of his professors, um, it's like Staub or something like that, is just Kremp. Kremp. Okay, sorry, I was not close that time uh kremp is basically just like oh you 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 read this trash and he's like yep and he's like wow you wasted your life you're an idiot uh, throw that shit away uh go get these books these are what you should be reading this is the true philosophy you should be studying and then victor goes to this other teacher whose name i've forgotten it's a longer name that starts with an f like like fr- frutalin or it, something like it that. is it is not it is waldman i was i was a little closer that time f and w Who are was closing a- letters who was a uh, chemistry professor. Yeah, and he's just like, oh, you read those guys. That's great. Without them, we wouldn't be where we're at now. Even if their stuff might be outdated, they're still they're still important to know. And he's like, yeah, do that. But make sure you also, um, you know, chemistry's great. And uh, you, I think you'd be a, a real talent for it. But make sure you don't ignore the other studies that are important to chemistry, like mathematics. Because otherwise, you're just an experimentalist and you're not a scientist. So... Make sure you study your Waldman. Too. Waldman is actually really nice. I, I yes. really like him as. I wish I wish he taught me chemistry because I had no idea what I was doing in there. I, I really suffered. I don't know. I had I a bad time. I don't know who your chemistry teacher was because we did not have the same class. But I really liked my chemistry teacher. I had her twice. Uh, I uh, because I, I had her for like uh, the the the. I, I I took chemistry twice because I had to drop it my my junior year because of my my absences that that happened because of my uh difficulties that i had uh with my my health in the the first half of our junior year of high school uh i had to drop the class because i i missed so much of it so i had to take chemistry again my senior year and i had her both times and i also i think i had her for a pre-chemistry class in like sophomore year or something i don't remember but my chemistry teacher in high school was great uh i learned i think it was like maybe three or four maybe five years ago that she ended up she passed with cancer uh so that was unfortunate uh well that's sad shout out to uh shout out to miss calhoun uh you were you were a real one uh and you were a fantastic chemistry teacher uh but yeah he was uh he was a great he, he was he, he seems like a really great teacher though he did kind of push push uh victor 
towards this uh, this dark path that he puts himself on. Not that he knew knowingly did that, but you know, it's just it, Victor didn't get told no in the correct ways. Uh, not that anybody could have known to. Uh, and he, he he reflects on this a lot. He's like he he says a lot throughout the. Oh yeah, if my father would have said this to me, then it would have taken me off that path. If if this teacher would have done this, then it would have taken me off this path. But because I just kind of didn't think about the consequences, I just kind of drove headlong into it. This is why my tragedy started, and because so of this, what you're saying you're saying is he didn't pick up context clues. Basically, he he's he's a real <laughs> he's a real Daniel here. Uh, and so he starts getting real deep into human anatomy, and that's what leads him down this path of trying to uh, to, to to eventually creating the monster. I think what happens is he's watching a thunderstorm, and. Uh, Oh man, I'm trying to. I, I read a lot of this today, and I read a lot of it uh, quickly. Uh, not not quickly, but just you know, I was enthralled by it. So a lot of this kind of bleed together. I know at some point he tells a story about how he he was watching a storm with his father, and he watched the lightning bolt strike a tree and basically obliterate it, and that's what kind of uh, influenced a lot of uh, you know the the power of of like electricity and nature and how like these forces are. Um, but yeah, it's it, he sees. Um, he sees an incident of I think it was like oh, if I remember correctly it was something like an animal ostensibly kind of being reanimated uh, and he just he takes the inspiration from that and he just kind of he's like well let's go larger what if I what if I could reanimate a man what if I could what if I could create this life reanimate this 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 this, this the, the most important the most complex creature on the planet and that's kind of how this whole thing starts is he just he wants to to go as big as he can with this and so he starts and he gets in the, he has the experiences the classic um hammond-esque hubris of of imagining the 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 fame and acclaim that will that will uh be afforded him as the creator of this new species yeah and this is where for me personally i mean this could have been me not paying the best amount of attention uh, the timeline gets a little muddled uh, because from him going to college to the end of volume one, it's been about six years and about, about two of those years he spends creating the monster. And I, I don't know if it's the first two years, like he leaves at like 17 and I don't, I don't know if it's the first two years from like 17 to 19 or if it's like a little later on in, in like maybe after a year or two, then he has the two years created. Them. It doesn't, I don't, I don't know if I missed something or if it's not explicitly stated, but basically the important thing is he spends two years doing this trial and error and building this body you know, by basically grave robbing uh, and just taking pieces of, of bones and, and body parts and ligaments and veins and he basically could it, it's exactly what you would expect knowing the the typical hollywood uh shows of frankenstein like how how, how hollywoodified it, it, it got with frankenstein the story of frankenstein um with like the they him, made it, frankenstein woke yeah right uh with this whole like pat, kind of patchwork body that he creates but one thing i find one thing i really love and i think this probably really caught you off guard is the description of the monster itself is so unlike anything you know if you only know frankenstein the story of frankenstein and the story of frankenstein's monster based off of like hollywood or the the modern kind of zeitgeist of of what frankenstein and frankenstein's monster is even even with something I wouldn't call it recent, but even with something like Young Frankenstein, which I, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say that's where a lot of your your uh, experience with it comes from. Uh, phenomenal Pretty movie. Pretty much exclusively, I would say. Phenomenal movie. Absolute absolute classic. Uh, you know, Mel Brooks is a legend. Gene Wilder was a legend. Uh, absolutely great movie, but <laughs> not at all what, what uh, is relevant to right now. Because, you know, you think of Frankenstein... And you think of the Frankenstein's monster, and you think of that old. Uh, I don't want to. This is the best comparison I can have, but the, the old like Universal monster, the uh, Boris Karloff one. Okay, I was gonna say kind of like the Herman, uh, not not the, the Eddie Mon the, Yeah, the Herman monster, the Herman monster s kind of monster. Um, but yeah, that that's a better way to put it because I'm assuming that's the actor that played him. Yeah. Uh, with well, the not in not in the monsters, but like in the 
orig- the Frankenstein movie. It was yeah, no, that's, what, that's what I meant. Yeah. No, no, uh, Herman Munster was um he oh god what was that oh, oh no I forgot the actor's name why did I forget his name oh he's such a good actor he's in he's you in uh, watched, Pet Cemetery. Uh... Oh, oh he was I, I I didn't realize that. Why did I forget his name oh he's such a good actor um. And now I'm googling it to try. Well, and find... you remember it before I Google uh, it. Fred oh. Fred Gwynn was the actor's okay. name. Also, a very very good actor. He played he played Herman Munster, but it's the it's the same look. That look was based off of the. You said what was his name? The actor. Uh, Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff. I almost said George. I almost said George Karloftis, which no uh, Frankenstein was not played by a uh, defensive tackle on the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So you I don't think he's a big he's a big guy? I think he, he can is. do a credible job. He, he 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 might. He very well might could. But, you know, you think of that monster with, like, the bolts in his neck, the green skin, the short hair, the, the stitches all over, and the, you know, the lumbering, the lumbering uh, green skin and all that. Uh, couldn't be further from the truth of what Frankenstein's monster is in the original book. He's got yellow skin. He's got long, flowing black hair. He's got a yellowish tint to his eyes. He's got stark white teeth. Uh, just really big, burly dude. Um, yeah, and Frankenstein finally creates this monster and uh, correct me if I'm wrong but there's no electricity involved at least th- there's no there's no like thunderstorm electricity involved see that's why that's why it threw me off <laughs> I was like where's the electricity where's Igor where's you know where's the tower you know all, all of that stuff is what I was expecting nope. so like, like this like is this, done in the, his college the, dormitory in the back room <laughs> So this guy cooking up a dude in his dorm room was, was was not at all what I was expecting. I know. The RA didn't come and complain about the smell once. <laughs> hey, I, hey, we're getting some reports that someone was smoking in here. <laughs> hey, uh, you got the reefer going in here? <laughs> it's it's sm- 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 it smells sm- like a skunk. They're, they're, they're smoking that good formaldehyde. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he basically just builds this body in his in like his back room of his dormitory, and uh, just kind of is like, and then I created him. It, it it's very just kind of, and then he's a matter of fact, yeah, yeah. And uh, he has this, uh, he has the he has this like kind of afterglow moment of clarity, where as soon as the the creature opens its eyes, he's just like, oh, I fucked up, I shouldn't have done this oops <laughs> and he just he, he leaves he just walks out of the room and he's just he's pacing around just like ah ooh yeah ooh that might have been Dang a mistake it, uh, mm, mm. and he's like you know what you, you know what maybe uh maybe you know maybe, maybe it's maybe maybe this will be nothing maybe this will this won't be a big deal and he just lays down to like to kind of rest for a second but he ends up falling asleep because this has been there's been a lot of sleepless nights. I think a lot of sleepless nights in a row here at the end. This took, like I said, this took two years. Um, he's 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 kind of emaciated a little bit because he's focused more on the work than on himself. So he's super pale. He's super sickly. Uh, he's he's just really out of sorts. He's unhealthy, and so he collapses in his bed and he falls asleep. And partway through the night, he wakes up, and the moon shining through the window illuminates the monster at the foot of his bed. He sees its its smiling face its yellow eyes and its hand reaching out towards him and it scares the hell out of him and he runs away he runs downstairs down to the dormitory and he basically uh he spends the rest of the night pacing around hiding under a desk and just listening and getting scared from like any noise that happens of possibly this monster coming down and trying to kill him and and so the next morning he goes up and his room is completely empty and he he just kind of writes it off. He's like, "Ah. Well, that's not that's it's not my problem anymore." <laughs> or no, actually, no. He doesn't do that yet. No, he he just leaves. He he doesn't go back up to his room yet. He just he just leaves the dormitory and he's expecting it to um the monster to show up behind him and, and be following him and come at him at some point. But um no, what ends up happening is uh he gets stopped by none other than Henry uh Clerval. He says, Ermagerd is Clerval. Yeah. 
<laughs> and he's like, I finally convinced my father to, to come let me go to college with you because uh, we didn't really talk about Henry too much earlier, but it's just basically it's Victor's only friend. And he wanted to go, come with Victor to college, but his father didn't let him because he's just like, nah, you're going to be a book boy. You're going to you're gonna study the books and be an entrepreneur a, like a, me. A book a bookkeeper. Yeah, basically. And he finally convinced his dad to let him come and stay with Victor. Or not stay with Victor, but go to college with Victor. And he just happens to see him. He's like, wow, what are the chances that I ran into you right here? Oh, how, what, 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 uh, what providence? And he's like, wow, Victor, you don't, you don't look that great. What's, uh, what's going on, man? Uh, yeah, you look a little ill. And they, they're chatting for a minute and Victor takes him back to his dorm and he's like, oh God, the monster's here. I, I'm, I'm scared that, you know, Henry's going to, he has Henry wait at the bottom of the stairs and he goes up and then that's when he goes in and realizes that his room is empty. And then at that point he's like, well, out of sight, out of mind. And so he just basically tries to forget the monster exists. But um, all of the uh, all of that work and all of that fatigue and all of the 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 bad that he had been putting his body through to to well, focusing on this experiment finally catches up with him, and he falls very very ill. I think he's out for like a couple weeks before he wakes up again, and then he he he, he it takes months for him to recover. And I'm thinking I think about they this. They refer to it as a nervous fever. Yeah, which seemed to happen a lot in the 18th century. Yeah, and I, 17th, I guess. I'm I'm thinking about this, and you know, maybe it's just it's it's just one of the 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 marvels of modern medicine, but I cannot imagine something that's all things considered pretty mild or minor, like a fever or something like this, putting you out of commission for months. Like it even says, like after he finally is is like feeling better in like somewhat more like himself and he's able to finally read a letter from elizabeth and then write a letter back to her it people takes just him, don't faint like they used to yeah it takes him a further two weeks before he can get out of bed and that's after months of being ill and like outside of you know a really really debilitating illness you know like cancer or like tuberculosis or even you know if you go 80, 80 years ago, or you know, you, you look a little bit now with some anti-vaxxers, polio, uh, you know, major, major diseases like that. Maybe in that situation, I could see someone being in bed for months at a time. But something like this, it's it's just weird for me to think about. Like how I've I've had a lot of fevers in my life, and it maybe took me out for like a couple days. You know, I, I was still able to get out of bed and like eat food but i was you know just in a lot of pain and just had like weird you know body temperature control and whatnot but nothing close to months let alone a week and i think it actually takes the better part of a year for victor to fully recover which is crazy but yeah yeah i, I don't know so but henry is his caretaker and henry kind of downplays uh victor's illness to his family with the the correspondence letters that he's writing victor kind of had been ignoring writing letters to his family something that they asked him to do uh because of his obsessions uh but he he introduces henry to his professors once he's better and henry starts to pick up on these these um these little minor um quirks that victor is showing uh, where he's getting uncomfortable and he's getting nervous and he's panicking a little when he sees anything involving chemistry or any of his f previous interests that had a hand in creating this monster. He, it has traumatized him to the point to where his entire, like, interests have changed completely. And Henry picks up on that and kind of, like, leads the, the conversations and the situations away from that. And he's actually there to study, um, what was it? It was, like, chi yeah, Chinese... Uh, it was like languages in general and something specifically with like the Chinese uh, Arabic Sanskrit and uh, Persian were the were, were what what they said he was studying yeah but isn't there something Chinese related that that Victor gets into as well just as a way to kind of uh, uh, I don't know maybe, maybe I just I just remember those but um, yeah more time passes uh i don't know eventually it's been six years they i also i also just think it's interesting that because when he's talking to his professors and he's you know they're they're talking him up and they're talking to uh clerval and they're like wow he's so great at this and he's he he's just so great he's just a brilliant mind and he's just kind of and uh frankenstein is kind of demurring and he's like and they're like and look how humble he is too <laughs> you know it's just it, that it is kind of kind of humorous in a way i think yeah 
yeah it's, it's he, he's he, yeah he, he's basically turning his back on on what he's most gifted at and it's it's understandable it, it he kind of he kind of built this trauma himself uh but yeah eventually uh he decides it's time for him to uh to go back to geneva and visit his family who he hasn't seen in six years at this point and well but they there's a reason he's going back to see his family not yet not yet there isn't uh oh, okay at first it's just he's gonna he's gonna go back to visit them because it's been a lot of time uh but there's a really bad winter that that delays it uh so then he's gonna go at the start of spring and uh he's just basically waiting for his father to give him the date he's like okay mm -hmm. you know just send me what day i'm coming and i'm gonna come uh, but then he ends up getting a letter from his father, and he's expecting it to just say, hey, this at this time, come. And uh, instead, what he gets is a letter from his father telling him that his, his youngest brother, William, has been murdered. They found his body uh, with, uh, with marks on his neck. He was strangled. Uh, I'm going to safely assume his neck was probably snapped, too. Uh, they found him after after losing sight of him because him and his in the middle brother were playing hide and seek basically, and they couldn't find him. And they found him the next morning. Uh, well, did, did, doesn't he have another letter from Elizabeth before then? Was there anything important in there? Uh, I don't remember. It, 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 the biggest thing about her letter this was when he was sick and he was feeling better and he was able to finally write back. Uh, I think the biggest thing about her letter was her very expositorily talking about um was was her name Jasmine the 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 maid yes the servant girl it's basically i i love this it's like this girl has been oh, wait, a servant sorry girl. it's it's justine justine thank you uh justine has been a servant girl for the frankenstein family for a long time like ever since Elizabeth since she was, was like 12 young. yeah so at this point it's probably been the better part of a decade or more uh with a minor exception of like a two-year gap where justine's uh justine right that's what you said yeah, Justine. Where, like, her, she went back to take care of her mother before her mother died, uh, despite the fact that her mother was a terrible woman that basically drove her away to the Frankensteins, <laughs> uh, to Elizabeth specifically. But it's like, I, I love this, man. So she's basically been a servant girl for the Frankenstein family for basically a decade at this point, probably more. And and in, in Elizabeth's letter to Victor, she's just like, and oh, yes, Justine, who you might know, who, by the way she grew up like this and she basically tells tells him justine's life story like she wasn't the servant girl to his family while he was still there uh, I, I know it's it's purely for the reader but i just found that really funny the, the absolute expository detail that elizabeth goes into in that yeah. letter to Victor. justine you may remember was a great favor of yours and i recollect you once remarked that if you were in an ill humor one glance from justine could dissipate it for the same reason that ariosta Ariost, Ariost, wait, what? Hold on. Are you reading the letter right now? Yeah, Ariosto gives. Okay, I thought it was. I thought that was one word on two different lines. Okay, Ario, Ariosto gives concerning the beauty of Angelica. She looked so. This is such a run-on sentence. She looked so frank-hearted and happy. Is there was like seven commas and uh, one, one m dash and one uh, semicolon in there. Yeah, and I love how she said she even says like, you you might remember she was always able to make you smile, but in that letter once again she gives her whole life story in it, and it, mm -hmm. it you know uh, for you dear you readers, I will say that this you you can tell I mean, not to take anything away from Mary Shelley in the slightest, but like more artful ways of of exposition have come since <laughs> yeah and i think it's kind of interesting just to see like th that's kind of how they were having to do and and she was also she was quite young when she wrote this yeah um, so yeah it's, i just i find it funny it's just kind of one of those things to where it's <laughs> it's it's just a funny a funny amount of exposition to a person that mm -hmm. that has known her for a long time and you know you mm -hmm. may be wondering why why do we have this really in-depth letter from the, the woman he's in love with talking about some servant girl like this is really strange i'm glad you asked we'll get to that in a minute uh so, but yeah he gets the letter basically saying his his brother has been killed and so then that that kind of sets the stage of him his his homecoming and he just kind of he kind of at first he's rushing home but the closer he gets the more he kind of meanders and really delays it because i guess it's partially because he's just not really ready to face it 
and in the final leg of the trip once he's back in geneva and uh he's heading to the house he sees off in the distance a giant eight foot tall figure which he immediately realizes is his monster and he also immediately realizes is william's murderer and uh how he how he sees how he stumbles upon it is there's this storm that's going on and he he calls he calls out to the storm uh william this is your dirge and i think it's like a flash of lightning and he sees off in the distance the monster and it, it paralyzes him with fear and the monster walks past him and he he thinks maybe to give chase to to his brother's killer but then the next time the lightning flashes he sees that the monster is currently scaling up a sheer cliff uh like mount mount um i don't remember the name of the mountain i don't, don't mount I block it, yeah so uh the monster is is escaping up the mountain and he's unable to pursue it and he has this fear that basically uh in a in a in a roundabout way he killed his own brother because it was his creation that he ostensibly let go into the wild murdered his brother and so he is responsible for it and when he gets home he learns uh from his brother his middle brother who i think is named ernest uh that justine is going to be going on trial tomorrow for the murder of his of william because um there is a lot of evidence to suggest that she did including a a picture locket uh, or like a picture necklace of their mother that william was wearing the last day that he was alive was found in justine's pocket and so you know what more proof do you need than she she took the locket from his neck after she murdered him and put it in her pocket uh he of course does not believe it because he knows that the monster killed uh william it had to have been the monster and elizabeth doesn't believe it because justine is too innocent she's too good of a woman uh she's she's too good of a friend she's too good of a person there's no way she could ever commit such an atrocious act and so she is she's very relieved that victor feels the same way and at their at her trial the next day um not not really anybody uh believes that and even justine herself is like well I understand that this evidence looks really bad for me and the only defense I really have is me saying that I'm innocent and if you deem me guilty then I I basically I look forward to seeing William again in the afterlife I will greet him and we will we will be together again in another world okay, uh, I, I have some thoughts here one how old was William again I, I don't know. I don't remember if it actually explicitly states, but he couldn't... If I had to guess, I would say no older than 10. Okay, but even still. Even still. All right. They they said that he was found with the handprint that of the hand that choked him around his neck. Yes. Could they not just compare it to Justine's much smaller hand and see, hey, hmm... Yeah, this doesn't seem right. Uh, this she's got like a small, a normal sized woman's hand, and the the this this hand that choked him was like, was like he was looking like Kawhi Leonard out there. Yeah, and I mean even the judge when when Victor goes to talk to the judge after she is she uh, is found guilty, the judge even says that we we don't want to we don't like convicting somebody on such circumstantial evidence. But the the thing that really does it is a priest basically forces her to confess to it he he interrogates her so hard and for so long that he he, he coerces a confession out of her and she even many said, such cases yeah and and the judge says like yeah we don't like we don't like uh serving a guilty verdict on such circumstantial evidence like the locket uh which he which she says she has no idea how it how it got into her pocket by the way she's like i can't explain it she's like i i don't know all i can tell you is i didn't do it and i don't know why it was in my pocket uh so you know i understand that might make me that might make me look guilty to all of you but i'm not and if you can believe that yay if not no and like yeah the judge is like but she she confessed to it in the end so we had to we had to rule it there's nothing we can do about it she's guilty and elizabeth and victor go to visit her because she requests to visit uh, elizabeth to visit her before she's executed the next day and she asks victor to come with her 
and Elizabeth's like, you know, why, why, why did you, why did you, why did you, why did you uh, confess to that? And she's like, yeah, that priest forced it out of me. I feel like a sinner now because I lied. Uh, but you know, he was just so cruel and he forced it out of me. And it's like, yeah, that sucks. That really sucks. But Elizabeth's like, I'm so glad you're innocent. I always believe that you're innocent. And Victor has always too. And Victor's sitting there just being like, oh my God, I did it. I did it. I did it. No one's ever going to believe me. What can I tell them? And that a, an eight foot tall yellow monster with long flowing, gorgeous black hair and pearly white teeth murdered my brother that I created in a lab. No, I would be a madman. And yeah, then Justine is executed the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he now has two two uh, victims on his conscience, and that's the end of volume one. Is is Justine's fate? And that that's well, that's all we've covered at this point in time. My book is uh, is is um, uh, separated into three volumes, so we will be covering as far as I mine has volume two next week, and the final volume the week after. Well, I think I think though we we got in some good stuff today. Um, there's a lot of sort of narrative hooks that will probably come back and like thematic things that we can come back and see later. Yeah, but excuse me, but I think I I don't know. I think so far I'm I'm very intrigued. I think despite its age, it is it is it's it's very gripping. You know, you don't you're not reading. I mean. Once you get used to the the, the slightly different language, the slight, somewhat archaic language, you it really moves along, you know, pretty quickly and pretty well, and it's it's very interesting. It, it holds your attention. Yeah, which if you would like to follow along, uh, I'm flipping through my book right now. Uh, so the first volume after the four letters uh, is eight chapters long. The first eight chapters of the book is volume one. Uh, the following nine chapters is volume two and this last chapter is very very long I am just flipping back through my, my book here and trying to find out what chapter is the last chapter and it's, it's, it's it looks like it's an incredibly long chapter because I'm flipping through a lot of pages it looks like it might actually be letters again uh, which makes sense it might the book might end with letters uh, seven there are seven chapters in volume three so eight nine and seven chapters respectively if you don't have your separated in volumes, that's the order it goes in. Uh, yeah, that's the end of volume one. And that's that's our first act of, of Frankenstein done. Our monster has, according to Victor, murdered at least one child and is uh, also in a roundabout way responsible for the, the death of Justine as well. Uh, Victor himself thinks he's responsible for them because of him, him, his creation of the monster. Whether you find Victor responsible for both deaths or uh, the monster responsible for both that, uh, deaths, I guess is up to interpretation. Maybe, maybe right now, but I mean, it, it's it's pretty clear that <laughs> that this is you can lay this at Victor's feet. I mean, well, I he, he created the monster, and then he like did not take responsibility for the creation of the monster. The monster broke containment and is and has now killed two people. That's I, I you can squarely lay that at his feet from my point of view. Yeah, but I would say at the very least with both of them, you could definitely say that Victor is he's at the top of the responsibility ladder there for their deaths. But it's also kind of one of those things to where at this point in time Victor was not trying to create a monster. He was just trying to create life. And his fear overtook him and allowed the monster to... I don't even want to say escape, because it's not like he was confining the monster. He allowed the, the monster... The monster just kind of walked out of the dorm room. The monster was, like, stumbling down the streets at, uh, you know, at, like, 2 in the morning, and the, some innkeeper was like, oh, college students these days. Yeah, yeah. Victor was working on the honor system and left the door unlocked. <laughs> And the monster just kind of he just kind of left. He's he's like I'm right, gonna head out and just kind of left. Um, I'll be right back. So yeah, while I do feel like Victor definitely like hold, holds responsibility in, in the end because he created the monster, I, I it's kind of one of those things to where you know the 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 road to hell is paved in good intentions he he didn't intend to create this monster that would murder his his brother or lead to the execution of one of his uh his servant girls uh 
No, he he just intended to be worshipped as a god by a race of of uh, of new beings. Yeah, he he wanted to play god, and his hubris <laughs> led to these deaths. So yeah, he's definitely responsible in that regard. But I don't think it's fair to say that like I I don't know I I I don't think it's fair to to put it solely on him because at the end of the day it was the monster that killed William. So well, but how would the monster know how to be? <laughs> he just created a new life and was immediately being rejected by his deadbeat dad. And then, like, well, left to to roam the wilds? I don't know. It might be worth pointing out, and I, I didn't point this out earlier, that at the time of William's death, it has been two years since he created the monster. So the monster has been out and about for two years. I mean, it's it's been a feral child for two years. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah, I, I, that's true. Um... But yeah, I guess my point is is while we can place the blame at Victor's feet, and he he's certainly already done so himself, and I do think it is it is worth noting the absolute guilt and uh, and sadness that he feels because of this. Um, let's also not forget the fact that the actual deed itself was committed by the monster, who would not exist if it were not for Victor. <laughs> yes, yes, that that is true. But let's not forget to also blame the monster where it's due as well. I'm not saying let's 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 wash Victor's hands of it. I'm saying let's not wash the monster's hands of it. I don't know. Maybe we'll go. Maybe we'll see as we go along. But I'm pretty sure it just. I feel like he needed to clue someone in. Like, hey, I kind of created a monster, guys. I I messed up. My thought process, <laughs> like my what I what I would have done you know as somebody completely detached from the situation and thinking oh yeah if i was there i'd have done it i'd have done this and it would have been perfect uh is you know why couldn't he have been like hey on my way here i was accosted by this giant man who was bragging about having murdered a child and then be like i basically ran into my my brother's killer on the road we should go after him like it totally wasn't her he told me what he did and I've come straight to you guys to tell you like he, he could have still played this off to where he could implicate the monster without one implicating himself and two telling a story that is more believable than I brought this giant corpse m creation to life and now it killed my brother I personally would have given him the hug when he appeared at my bedside and, yeah. and thus he would have been my best friend versus my brother's killer yeah but that's just me it so wouldn't have gone down that way if i was there he could have done something but instead he decided to wallow in his self-pity and guilt and let 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 justine's death happen and by the time he did try to do something about it it was too late well we'll see how this where this goes i'm sure i wonder if we will see what the monster got up to for the months or even years that he while well, he was where he was uh, roaming the the alps and the 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 central european countryside yeah uh yeah i mean you know we'll we, we will see uh what happens next time and we will maybe get uh some more answers some more information and maybe more because as victor states this was just the beginning of his sorrows and so we might get to see what more horrors, tragedies, and uh, consequences Victor Frankenstein will face as of the result of his creation. Yes, who's who's ready to go experience more sorrows? <laughs> After last month's book, I know I am. <laughs> Well, this has been uh, another episode of the Sad Boys Book Club. I am Daniel. I'm Dusty. And we will see you next time. Take care. <laughs>